All right. I'd like to thank everyone who came and on behalf of the uh, association today for everyone who came out and attended all our classes and our speakers for taking their weekend and time to help out the folks in our industry. Um, I see a show of hands who's members of the association, Ohio Association. Awesome, awesome. Anyone who's not, I hope today you can see some of the value that we give and we want everyone to be better dealers, learn how to be successful. Um, my name is Jay North. I'm on the board. I don't know if I said that or not. But it's what it is. So um, I'd like to introduce Melissa from Advantage GPS. Yes, that is correct. And Mark from uh, Relentless Recovery. Hello. And it should be an interesting session. They're going to talk about fraud and used car business from the top of our our mind. Yes, absolutely. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, we have a little bit of tension here. So we are going to fix through this. We need to use our note off of our laptop here. Um, this afternoon, we are going to cover common types of fraud in these car sales. As Mark here, Amy and her husband was unable to make it last minute. Um, she has some stuff to come up with the family. So Mark's going to kind of take over. We'll start the, for him and Amy. Um, like you said, I'm Melissa with Advantage GPS and National Sales Director. I'm out of Iowa. Ohio, um, I deal a lot with new car dealerships and any kind of dealerships in the Ohio area. This is Mark, he's with Relentless Recovery. So he's maybe a little short introduction. We'll get started. He's correct, I'm Mark. Um, <laughs> nice to meet everyone. So I'm with uh, Relentless Recovery, uh, ERA Collateral Recovery. You know, we're also members of the American Recovery Association, which is team uh, here today to help out individual dealers because as we all know depending on if you do your own in-house financing or otherwise you might need to get that, that vehicle back so this is the tail end of the business here so look forward to helping people today hopefully that's the case. Thanks Mark. We're going to go over some fraud risk. Um, the latest fraud insights identifying one in five of retail fraud this one of real world full scale fraud use of cases and preventing um, some best practices to make sure that you guys are aware of fraud as it's coming into the dealer. Uh, we're going to go over auto loan risk, fraud, loss in 2022, identifying risk is up 35% from 22 to 23, and then income and employment is down. So that is always an indicator to a dealer. The employment is down, that's a pretty big sign that there's been some fraud, not for the two payments. Um, and we're going to go over some auto lending. Um, sorry, guys. So, all this information that we collected for you, all of you, is from Point Predictive. Uh, you guys can jump on their website at any time to get all this information. It goes over this um, identity, dealer fraud, theft, title fraud, payment fraud. What was the name of it? It is point predictive. Point predictive? Yeah. At the end of this, we'll have a QR code that everybody can scan so you can have all of this information to see. Um, So types of pre-sale fraud, identity theft, title ownership fraud, um, salvage fraud, credit washing. Mark's going to kind of go into all of these details a little bit further for all of you. Wait, does everybody, if you go back one slide, does everybody know what these terms are or, or uh, experience that one? Uh, there you go. Is everybody familiar with this? terminology or if you had any on hand experience with it when you when you sold the vehicle that someone's been brought in so well I understand I think yeah right well straw straw borrowers you you take a third party who may or may not have 
decent credit, but there's a buyer behind them. They send them into the dealership. There's never any intention to pay the notes thereafter. They may be, in theory, a legitimate loan or, or not to be based on their, their credit or their ability to pay, or it could be based on all the things up there that they cross uh, back. So it's like a no party that insulates uh, the real fraudster from everything. So um, credit washing is an actual person who's committed fraud, identity fraud, or whatever. And of course, it impacts their, their possibly their own credit score. They were reports of a financial institution that, in fact, their identity was stolen. So they want them to repair their credit when they're actually the reason it's in the state of condition. So, um, obviously, uh, salvage fraud, uh, you know, as a, a dealership, you're required under law to notify the prospective buyer that this vehicle is a salvage title. Right. You know, and then when you don't do that, then they're going to call that salvage fraud. Because I, I mean, not directing any dispersions of anyone in this room, but there's also going to be fraud from the dealers then as well as the buyer. So these are these are common things uh, that we're seeing all the time now. Um, so it, it, you know it's good to know. I mean if you're if you're trying to identify what the problem is, you need to be aware of it, what it is. And of course, without those two things, you're not going to be able to, to have best practices in place. I don't know how that be Yeah. So well, I, I'll give an example. So I have friends that are independent uh, auto dealers in the Cleveland area. So uh, there is a, you know, in the fraudsters, the individual could be groups of people. You know, they could be organized. They could, they could do multiple, uh, usually they do multiple frauds at one time because they take that amount. They could do seven deals in one day based upon the same false information. They go to different dealerships in order to, to apply for a loan and try to get the delivery of the car. And it's going to take time for the, you know, credit, the lender or the credit bureau or anybody finds out what the dealerships finds out what's going on. So, but in, in this specific instance, uh, somebody had, was able to purchase 21 vehicles, and once they had accomplished that, then of course you know the fraud not to be detected for you know weeks if not months. Uh, then they went to the state of this is out of Ohio. They went to the state of Kentucky, and then reported the vehicle stolen. And got new titles issued under a Kentucky title, and then they brought the vehicles back to uh, the vehicles never left Ohio. Then they came back to Ohio to use the Kentucky titles in order to transfer them back into Ohio, and then they went. And of course, at the end of the day, these people want the equity out of the vehicle. That's what it's about. They're not keeping these cars. They're not driving them around. They're gonna as soon as they they get possession, they're gonna try to sell them and, and get their as much money out of them. So what they're doing then is they're altering the title or the ownership in order to take a vehicle that's not theirs and, and, and you know, trade it into a dealership or they come to you and say, you know, I've got this car, it's worth 35000 you know, but I, I, I'm really hurt and I need some money, you know, I'll, I'll take 25 for it. And, you know, most big dealerships or, or places like that do a high buy and they're like, yeah, we'll, we'll, get, we'll cut you a check on the spot. In this, uh, in this particular instance, the dealership, in Cleveland, uh, it was an Audi worth about twenty-eight to thirty thousand dollars. They came in, wanted to sell it to them for twenty. Um, one of the uh, the brother who was in the business with Mike, uh, Mike, Mike, friend and uh, colleague, uh, talked the guy down to ten thousand, and then got title to the car. I don't know where he got title to the car. So uh, then the Ohio BMB, which is going to be the BHP in Ohio, that pretty much catches the fraud when it comes to titles and transfers, uh, sent out an agent and said, oh no, this isn't your car. Uh, you can't title it, you can't sell it. And you know, the irony of the whole thing, they left the car at the dealership, they still have the car, they're driving it uh, to a dealer place because, uh, you know, then of course on the back end of all this, when you do a fraudulent loan, usually the lending agencies have insurance so that it pay off their, their end of it and then you guys are the ones who are going to get stuck because it's my understanding that when you're dealing with used cars, your insurance options are not as good as, as the big dealerships who are selling the, the new inventory, right? So you're going to be the one stuck paying that money back, uh, or you're never going to recoup your your investment or, or your payment. Same thing with your inventory. If you're carrying, 
vehicle down your lot and someone comes in and does identity fraud to, to get you to induce you to sell that vehicle to them and then the lender finds out they're going to most of them are going to demand that you pay the money back so you're the guys that they're really you're on the front lines and you're going to be the guys that are getting stuck financially you know so it's important to you know be aware of what's going on among one of the many things that obligations that you folks have you know crib stoning is um hold on I had to write that one down too because it's not something that uh, uh, in the dealership, uh, okay, you, you sell a vehicle to someone off the books. So you're looking to avoid sales tax or you're looking to avoid fees that may be incurred. So you're, you know, you're doing, you're doing a, a deal directly with somebody off the books. And again, like I said earlier, you know, that when you look at fraud, it's just not the fraudster coming into your lot. It could be an unscrupulous dealership that's looking to you know, take advantage of, you know, someone or work with someone to save money. Okay. And it's good you don't know these things, because that means you're not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so these, you know, I don't want to reread everything here, but I think we talked on this, um, you know, this risk index here. Uh, these are what uh, people are submitting when they're trying to do a fraudulent loan. You know, so they're giving fake social security numbers, they're giving uh, fake employment numbers, um, you know, synthetic uh, personas, you know, you can take someone's social security number and change the last four digits. And you create a fake social security card. And again, part of the problem is, it's, it's amazing in this day and age that, you know, you get a copy of the driver's license, you get a copy of the social security card, that's pretty much enough on its face to process a loan, right? And they, this is what people were doing. And uh, I've talked to other deal. I've, I've talked to a, a finance guy at four dealerships up in the Cleveland area, and um, and also the small dealerships. And how many of you folks are doing online applications for loans and cars? You guys doing any of those? So that's another way they're they're perpetrating fraud. So they're you may never even touch flesh with these people. You're you're seeing this application uh, on the phone, or I mean on, on the internet online you know you, you set them up with your particular lenders or whoever you folks are using and uh, you know from your perspective you want you're waiting for the loan to be approved right and the loan comes in and you deliver the car and then of course you never see the car again and they're gone and you know it seems like they're using this this trick a lot now where they're you know doing all this stuff online they're not even coming in person anymore they're doing it online that's another thing to be aware of. And so, all right, you know, what are some of the, the warning signs on these? All right, so, you know, this is where, I mean, you guys, you're, you're business people, I'm sure most of you are the owners of your businesses, so you didn't get there by accident. You know, you, you've got hard work experience. Um, you know, you gotta use your instincts, you gotta use um, your judgment. You know when things are unfolding in front of you. You can't just obviously everyone's in business. They want to sell uh, vehicles. They want to make money. They want to do it on the best terms they can. But you get caught up in, in the dollar sign sometimes, and you got to really pay attention to your to your gut instincts. Um, and here are some of the things uh, that you might want to look for uh, if you think you may be being played or someone's attempting to do. Um, uh, fraud here on a, on a purchase. And of course, um, you know, you see the record of the car here, uh, as I indicated earlier, relentless recovery is collateral recovery, so we work for all the major banks in the United States, the big ones, and we work for a lot of credit unions, we, we work for a lot of, uh, you know, secondary market uh, creditors, so, um, you know, part of the warning signs are when you do do a deal, and of course, I think you folks are probably out of that unless you're self-financing yourself and house uh, financing. But there's no first payments never made, or, you know, second payments never made, and that's that's obviously by that point it's too late. But that's obviously your greatest indicator that hey, this must be a fraudulent transaction here because usually you get a couple payments out before people default, and. Um, in the case where you're doing your own financing, uh, you know, you're going to need to have uh, someone 
go look for that vehicle. Maybe you got a GPS money around or maybe you don't, but you know, you, that's where you've got to you can locate the property and the collateral. Okay, so, you know, literally, they're advertising this fraud online. So, you got Facebook group here where they're offering vehicles without titles. Okay, but in this instance, I think it's more of a case of they've already committed the fraud, they've already defrauded a, a dealership or a, a lender, and now they're, you know, how are they getting their money back? Well, now they're selling these cars directly to people who don't care that it doesn't have a title. They'll put a fictitious plate on it and they'll drive it until kingdom come or it breaks down, right? So uh, these people are organized. It, it, it could be one or two individuals or it could be a group of individuals. I mean, it's a sophisticated organized crime. I mean, I've read stuff where uh, one, one group of fraudsters, I, I believe it might have been California, they, they opened, uh, they created like 47 shell companies. They had bank accounts for each company and they hit it all at one time and they did like $5 million worth of credit uh, fraud. And they got done. Uh, and it was all said and done. So they're out there. They're, they're, they're bold and about it. They're, you know, with uh, social media now. I mean, they're on Facebook. They're on Instagram. They're, uh, I have experience with that too, where they're literally, you know, there's other forms of fraud that may lead to you know, dealership fraud, but they're actually advertising checks. You know, I get you a check, and then you know, people get the check, and they're able to use the information on it to create a new check and deposit it. And they may be doing that as you know, uh, to facilitate uh, dealership fraud. So um, pay attention, educate yourself, Google it, read about it, um, because, like I said, at the end of the day, if they get you guys, odds are you're going to be the one paying the money back. So you got to be really diligent and aware of what's going on in your industry. And here, uh, for instance, here now, this is a survey of um, how many lenders requested folks in your situation who've been defrauded to pay back the amount of loan, or 85%. So here, uh, maybe you're in the 15% category, God bless you, and 26 sometimes. So you just don't know. I mean, this is, you know, business is about, uh, you know, the X's and O's, the red, red and the black, um, you know, and you've got to, you know, you don't want to be duped. Too many times. I mean, uh, obviously, it can happen to anybody. And I've talked to a lot of uh, people in the business, and you know, like, well, how can you stop this? And what can't you verify this or verify that? And really, it seems like we're limited until you know. I, I suggest, well, we need a DNA sample and a fingerprint, you know, because if these people are coming in, that might be a deterrent because they don't want to, you know, leave a trail. Um, or like we talked earlier with straw buyers, they're bringing some third party in. Happens a lot with uh, check fraud, where it'll, usually it's a guy finding a girl or a young girl, and like, hey, you want to make 500 bucks? And at this point, she has no criminal record. She has a job. She has a bank account. They take one of these fraudulent checks. They made payable to her from a business or wherever they stole it from, and then you know, of course it's 10 or 15 thousand. They put it in the account. She'll get a thousand of it, and the, and the guy who orchestrated it gets it all, and then she's the one who gets prosecuted because they never find the person, the brains behind it. And you know, it's just prevalent everywhere. And any, anywhere where there's money and banking, uh, checking, uh, financing, it's rampant. I mean, and, uh, it could be coming at every angle. I mean, it could have been fraud against the fraud against the dealership. So. And you know, of course, uh, the world's changed since COVID, but um, as a result of COVID, the number of, of, of repossession agencies are down nationwide. Regulations are up and repossessions are up. Um, so, uh, you know, it's a cause and effect of, of COVID. It's also uh, a situation where, you know, people aren't going to be as flush maybe as you think they are um, because you've got to look at the employment sector, uh, it's good times, bad times. Uh, people are coming in and they want to get a car loan or not put any money down. And they show up in a brand new car in the parking lot. They don't argue about. Extended warranties you might want to sell them or any um, 
expert, you can ask the loan to agree to everything. Now that's a sign that, hey, maybe this isn't what it seems to be. We've got to be careful. Yeah, Jim. Um, so, you know, probably the, uh, you know, what are the takeaways from all this? Well, um, you know, I'm going to ask when we get done with this presentation, we can have uh, answering questions in here. But I'm more curious to hear from you folks that have experienced it and what you're doing to avoid it in the future and what you can share with your colleagues, you know, because that's why they have these associations, whether it's the repossession industry, uh, the finance industry, the dealership industry, for people to talk and talk about common problems or experiences and issues. And I think that's uh, what everyone in this room needs to be engaged in, you know, to be aware of what's going on in our, in our industry and what other people that are, you know, even through our competitor or the halfway across the state, what are they doing to avoid this and what can they impart on you guys to help you out? Okay. Um, so the best practices here, what's wrong with you? No, go ahead. You are way more savvy in this than I am. So, you know, again, I mean, obviously some of you could be mom and pop, some of you could be, you know, mid-sized, but, you know, you, you have to have, you know, you can say build a fraud team, you know, you have to have someone that's overseeing things and someone, you know, can't be forgotten, can't be regulated to the, the back corner. You've got to be proactive about this and be aware. And like I said, I think the best thing is follow your instincts, follow your experience. You know, even that example I gave, I even joked around with my buddy whose brother is the one about the car for 20. I said, well, good thing Chuck was talking down 10 grand because you would have been out 20,000. <laughs> you know, here you think you get the deal and you still got 10 grand even though you lost 10. So, you know, follow your instincts. And if it's too good to be true, then, then really, you know, heed your instincts. Um, but I think, too, you know, the other thing is, you know, I don't know what kind of relationships you have with your lenders or your finance companies or, you know, what are they doing? What can they do to help you guys? You know, what what safeguards are in place through them? I mean, um, you know, to me it's, it's surprising that, you know, another example too, we had a, a Ford dealership, they had an online application, a, a big Ford dealership up in the Cleveland area. Uh, everything came through, I went through Huntington Bank, Right side of uh, Columbus here. Huntington approved the loan, and the dealership was just waiting for uh, the paperwork to come over in order to deliver the car. Well, lo and behold, the real John Anderson, I just made that name up, calls, says, Hey, I didn't do this loan, and that's how they caught the fraud in that case. So, um, he got a fraud alert. yeah, he probably got a fraud alert at his bank with Huntington Bank. Yeah, uh, he, you know, he had a fraud alert. Call them, thank gosh, because otherwise the car would have been gone, um, and you know the rest of the story from there. So, you know, ask questions. You know, uh, how, you know, everyone's part of this uh, equation. What what can we do working together and independently working together to to help seed this or avoid this or implement something technologically? I think you know a perfect example. This online application is a, it's a great thing. It's convenient for people, but it's opened up Pandora's box to, to Probably easier to do it because they're never in person. You don't know if you're going to get away with it. And these people don't care. They're, they, once they get the title in the car, they're going to go sell it to whoever they're doing and get their money back out of it. Um, obviously, the best practices, too, then, you know, if you're self financing, um, you're going to need to recover that collateral if you can. Again, but these people don't care. They'll throw a fictitious plate on it, they'll take a car, a plate off a similar car and put on. Um, you know, and if it's a run of the mill car, no one's really going to notice it. And, you know, and that's just that's just the sad reality of it. And you know, of course, uh, educating state and federal legislatures. I mean, obviously, you're you're probably going to be too busy to do that. But I think that's really the, the job of the creditors because they're the ones that are being duped and providing money. Um, you know, this is going to hurt everyone around the country. It's just you know, it just keeps escalating and going up, you know, and that, that's probably one that's going to be addressed by, by state and, and Congress. And there's certainly plenty of criminal statutes, because everything we're talking about is criminal, don't forget. This isn't just a civil thing. Now, whether or not the states or uh, local municipalities are going to uh, prosecute, I mean, in the case of uh, my friend who bought the Audi, when the investigators came out, they said, oh, this is a civil matter, we'll sue them. 
So, you know, of course, if they're as good and skilled as they are in identity fraud, you're never going to know what their real identity is. So, <laughs> you're only going to provide the fake name they gave to you. So, it's almost impossible, you know, to uh, track the people down. All right. So, we're going to pull up that Justin Piano uh,
I don't know. Like I, I know I could give you a ten for a tag, but right. Well, yeah, it wasn't a scam. Yeah, as long as it wasn't a fraud, right? right. That's, that's their problem. You pay cash. Well, yeah. Okay. Right. Well, I think that's yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're that's yeah. If, if grandfather was paying cash with power of attorney, then you probably would pay. Yeah. Because <laughs> no one's going to pay cash and do a fraudulent transaction. I can make it. Oh, go ahead. I've been in business for 34 years, so any problem that could happen has happened. Right. You know, when the husband comes in to trade his wife's car in, and on him a new, another different car, right. and the lady signs, and nobody checked that she was actually his wife. Right. And then the wife calls up a couple days later and says, he traded my car in. Yeah. And we had to give the car back to her. Right. Or it could be a divorce decree too. Yeah. There'd be a legal proceedings going on where she's unawarded the car by the court and you're yeah. giving it, you know, straight it into this guy. That's where, you know, it's just I mean, you know, again, you know, let's face it, you're in this business, if you've got that inventory in the lot and you're paying the, the, the interest on that thing while before you sell it, you want to get rid of those things as fast as you can. And that's that's fine and normal, but don't allow that cloud judgment, you know, and, and see what's really happening. You know, you've got to really be diligent when it comes to that kind of thing. Yeah, if it just doesn't make sense, it's probably, probably something more to it. Or, or you're dealing with, a, you know, some of the language barrier or issue that you're not sure about. Because if they really want that car, they'll come back the next day, right? Um, it gives you time to do some due diligence and everything. That's what I was going to say. So, Depending on the size, I know we're all smaller independent dealers here for the most part. If you are not the one who takes care of the sales process, and you can have salespeople who do it for you or do the process for them, it's very important that you train them on these types of issues that they know what to look for, you know what's out there. Right. Know to look for them, bank check stubs, or train them to learn about these situations that are maybe they just are jaded enough, like we tend to become, better be aware of it. And I think, too, my, a friend of mine that was really helpful, uh, I asked more questions of him, but I could have brought him here to talk to you as well. But, you know, he, he said it's easier, he believes it's easier to scam the bigger credit or the lender, you know, like the Huntington, the Ally, because they're so big and they do so many mass loans a day. You know, he brought up a good example too. It's not unusual for someone to go to the dealership and dealership. Oh, yeah, I'm looking for more for my trade. You know, I'm looking for more uh, or for the best deal I can get. You know, from this dealership, and then you know, maybe each dealership pulls a credit report, and the banks are used to seeing that. They're used to seeing maybe one or two credit reports. That's normal. That's you know, uh, so they're they're not going to you know look for someone who's done seven transactions in one day. They're just thinking, well, they're just out shopping. So he thinks it's easier to, to get the bigger toys than it is the little guys. And, you know, and I think that's where you guys do have an advantage because, you know, you're not huge, you're not just thirsty for, for volume and, and sales. You know, you, you have more ability to catch it or identify or use your instincts in order to avoid being scammed. Or there, it's just like a paper transaction more or less. You know, you're actually on the front line. One of the common things we realize that I saw when it comes to the fraud is the pay stuff that you present in most of the times. You know, the taxes, taxes are great. So, whatever figure you take, whatever amount you have paid, the gross, the tax, it's going to come out with some sand at the end. But these people don't know that. They always add zeros yeah. to every number on that. You see zero from head to toe. Don't work with it. It's definitely a, a problem uh, pay stuff. Because and some of the other things I've read, uh, where some of these people, when they're bigger, they'll even go to the extent of the number they provide you to call to verify employment is their number. Yeah. So when you call to verify employment, oh yes, John Doe works here. He makes this much a year. I mean, it's crazy, but you know what? It must be easy because they're doing it. And on the EMT page, don't make sense too. You take the pay stuff, you, <coughs> you ask them how long have you been at this job. 
So I've been here five years. But a year to date, we're in October. And it's like four thousand dollars. And do you work at home? Do you work forty hours? Yeah, I do. But it doesn't make sense. If you even if you don't make ten dollars an hour and from January to October, you should be making more than whatever amount is there from year to date. So you take that number and you ask them how long you've been there and you see they make 14, 15, 16, 20 dollars an hour and you see 40 hours or 80 hours for the two weeks, they don't make sense. Like when you add all of those, it should be more than the year to date or it should be less than the eight hour for the cast or under cast, they don't think about it. They only put 40 hours, 80 hours, 40 dollars, 10 dollars, then the other numbers that we had a lady coming in there and we said, okay, we have a pay stub, we said, where's the Amazon? Right, Amazon's a big company. We have a pay stub, we said, oh, I left it at home. Amazon has an app, you can go online, print it out, can you? Oh, I think I remember. So we went there, there's this Excel, something template online that has ADB and Amazon and all the big companies. She went there, she printed it out, and we realized it was fraudulent. So we asked her, all right, do you have your most recent one because the date on it was like three months ago. Most recent one. And the most recent one with the one she printed for us three months ago is the same numbers. Okay. She just changed the date. Right. Okay. It's the same numbers. So okay. I didn't say they were smart, but yeah. guess what? Yeah. <laughs> if you're not smart, they're gonna get they're gonna get a free car. The smart ones are the ones we worry about though. Yeah. Yeah the smart ones won't be worried. Yeah, they're reference professional. I have a question. So, say say some say this, a person like this is right in front of our face. We know what they're doing. We know that they're trying to scam. Is there anything that we can do to stop them or call law enforcement or like, how, or do you or do you have no choice but to be like you have to leave or how does that? Oh yeah, I mean here nobody, you know, nobody, somebody walks into your dealership. You, know, you don't have to sell them a car, right? I mean you you look at cri what are your criteria to sell them a car? Obviously they have to. I mean, how many people there run credit reports on people when they try to get a loan? Okay. And then I know some of the like credit acceptance, I think, on Mac, and you, then you guys pull credit acceptance. They have Mac, they pull a, car, uh, a credit report, I understand. But, I, you know, I, I, I even talked to my buddy about that, but I, I, it's still not an end all be all. If you run a credit report, can you match that credit report up to the documents maybe they provided you, right? Is there any, you know, the addresses match, the phone numbers? You talk about credit acceptance. What we have got a question like that about the account. Look, there's nobody better recruited than the account than those guys. Right. Send it over to them. Whether you're going to give them the deal or not. Right. Send it to them to put it right. out because they know how to do the research on the right. I'm telling you, there's nobody. Uh, and that's that's what I was saying earlier. You get rely on them as well to help everyone out. And we're all in this. We're all in the same game. You know, and you're you're really partners. Just like if you lost that option, something with credit acceptance, they didn't want to work with you anymore. That's going to be a hardship for you, probably, you know, because you're dealing with a lot of uh, clients that probably because they don't have great credit to begin with, right? And then now you just lost that avenue. So it's important. A couple other things that we've done. We're all on Facebook. Sometimes we get that person who's not sure of it. Search for them on Facebook. Just Google them. And if they're a real person, they're going to show up. In most cases, somewhere. Mm -hmm. To answer his question, buy in, counter, situation like that, one, like you said, I'm not selling to you. Now, I don't have control over what you say about me online. You can sit anywhere and take your computer, go to Google Review, give me a horrible one, and it's going to drop my ratings down. So people look at my ratings and go, oh, you have good ratings. There's nice things about them, but one goes to that store. So what I do is I send you out of the dealership nicely in a nice yeah. way. Like, look, I'm sorry, um, the bank couldn't verify this information. Um, you have your most recent, recent one. You just give me a most recent, but I'm still asking you your most recent, recent one. This is my way of telling you I'm sorry, no, but you have, you have to go now. I'm not going to tell you it's a fraudulent thing because you can accuse me for wrongfully accuse me for something. I know that information very well. Credit acceptance, I will send it to them. They'll even scan that. And for credit acceptance to continue, they can even block that customer without even doing business with them because they know they're sending a lot of fraudulent information. So 
for me nicely until you send me, give me the most recent one. Right. Um, you bring it in, well, they can verify this. We have a bank statement because if you actually work here and the direct deposits your money to you, right. it will show in the bank statement. Can I get a bank statement too? Can you get on your account right now? I will help you um, send the PDF to my email. I'll print it out. I'll send it to bank. We'll get you approved right now. Can we do this now? If you cannot give me a bank statement, then that's the right. reason I'm going to send you home. Go home, give me a bank statement. Right. Go to your bank, talk to your bank, that give me a bank statement. Because I want, I really want to sell your car. Right. I want to sell your car. I don't want to say it's fraudulent, so it's just fraud. So whatever I can do to make it right, I'll sell you a car. I don't even need it. That's why you're here. You probably don't work there, whatever. If you can prove to me that an income with that same company you say work with, I want to work with you. But in most cases, they don't work there. Right. They don't have it. So they're not going to get me the bank statement. That's my nice way of saying I'll see you in a minute. And I would guess that if you're dealing with a per person that's discussing fraud or identity fraud or loan fraud, you're not going to hear from them again when you say resistance is the right word. But when the more questions you ask, the more verification you require, they're going to realize how much they get. The wall is going out to the next lot. Hopefully a problem with that slot down the street from everybody in that house. Sometimes we do talk to each other and we tell them, look, um, this guy came here suspicious, wants to test drive this car, we didn't let him, you guys got to watch out. And unfortunately, the last one before we could make the call, the guys were already there, they gave him the car, he won the car, he <laughs> fell off and made a whole lot of mess over there, and I just saw the thing called the alien, but we try as much as possible to uh, let everybody, these guys come in. But if it's fraud, I can't tell you this guy is coming as well. I mean, you have to also do your thing. But if the guy is suspicious about just wants to test drive cars, like the most expensive car, wants to just test drive the most expensive car, I'm like, okay, uh, can I have your ID? You know, those that you have a lot of to give me the ID. And uh, are you, I mean, asking questions and the response I'm getting, it's a lot of hesitation. Yeah, then answering me, giving me the okay, there's something fishy here. I don't want to, I don't want you to tell about my car. If you don't want to give me your name or your ID, I can't let you drive this car. Another example, too, on a friend that has a dealership, and they said a dealership, somebody just drove the car, the cell phone goes with them. Yeah, they got the certain points that it's about, and they drove off with the car. Wow. And you said it was a 2016 Impala on the Sunni car that, you know, they're going to throw plates on that thing and drive it until, you know, they can't drive it anymore. So, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I always take a picture of the driver's license because I had one, you know, early on, young man, nice enough guy, and test drive. And I went with him, and on the way back, he said, okay, yeah, I like it, I'm going to buy it, I'm going to have to put it on my mom's thing. He's like, oh, yeah, no, no, no problem, but how come? I don't have a driver's license. <laughs> <laughs> they're so like, I mean, they're so easy once they get fake ID now, too. So, how do you know that the driver's license is even? Yeah, it's better than not. Uh, in my right. case, in this case, I didn't, I right. went with him and yeah. I didn't check his driver's license. We didn't have one. Well, that's yeah. the problem, too. We just see a legitimate license. They just stole it. They're assuming that identity. So, well, they ordered it online. And yeah. Completely she paid right. cash on it. Yeah. Right. Well, <laughs> hey, I'll go on a limb. Anybody's coming in and making a gas purchase, so probably not committing fraud. But the other presentation that? scared me about the buy here, pay here. Yeah. So they're talking about GPS. <coughs> oh my God, that's such another pitfall, another pitfall, another pitfall. Right. I don't but know. I tell you, what, I don't know, and if you're not experiencing it, but it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to stick the GPS on a car that's going this test drive. You never know. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah, 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 I had to. Yeah, I had another one that went 45 minutes later. I'm like, hey, you I, I've used them for stalking. So, yeah. but my own relationship, I want to follow the man. You know, I'm a GPS on there. You know, this is being filled. Right. <laughs> <laughs> there's that a lot of GPS companies out there that have wireless devices now. They're great, and that's a lot of people are using them for now. Is for test driving. Well, like an AirTag or something. Well, AirTag is better. Right. Yeah, it's better than an AirTag. Anybody that has an Apple device. Well, you well, know that you have an air tag and that they're being called. So yeah, I know that. When my son turned 16 and I got him a car, and I'm like, all right, I'm divorced, so, you know, there's different rules in my mom's house and dad, so I'm going to put an air tag in there. And then my buddy told me, they'll, they'll know. They'll know. And I'm like, okay, I can't do that. So, 
Yeah, it's all in faith and hope. Right? You know, he, he did well. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, before we all leave, um, head back into the uh, uh, main area. There's going to be drawing giveaways. Uh, we've got time to talk to vendors. If there was someone you missed, there's no answer. So. Yeah. Once you get in here, it's challenging to find where you're going. Yeah, too. Well, when we, when we finally got there, it had a 